I claim to understand the inevitable social evolutionary force that um, leads to a lot of brokenness in the human world. It, it, a social evolutionary force that grows out of the anarchy that um, the rise of civilization inevitably plunges a creature into because it means leaving a an order, an ecological, biospheric, natural order that has been evolved biologically to be able to take itself ever further into the future as long as the sun gives it energy to do the job, which means that the interactions of the, of the parts are, are regulated in the, in, to perpetuate that overarching system, meaning that even it, within which the uh, parasites and the hosts and the predators and the prey are, are uh, nature red and tooth and claw, more fundamental than that is an order that regulates their interaction in the service of the perpetuation of life and the whole system of life. But our species took an unprecedented step onto the path of civilization unprecedented in that it creates something not created by natural selection. After three and a half billion years of that being the only game in town, now we've got a creature that's got the creative intelligence to uh, uh, change the rules and create something which is, exists outside of that ecologically evolved biospheric order with nothing to regulate how these new life forms will interact with each other. A new kind of disorder replaces the order. That disorder is anarchy. Anarchy means a war of all against all. A war of all against all generates a selective process so that only those cultural, first of all, only those cultural options that are uh, able to prevail in such a uh, war of all against all will survive and spread. If you look at the implications of that, I think you see the whole human story in a fundamentally different light. And it, I, I see no hole in the argument. And it also shows how world, how the, how people get broken. You get bro people get broken by having to exist in a world where things like Putin's invasion of, of Ukraine will be uh, a traumatic part of the experience of people, you know, for the, that'll ramify for generations even with at the epigenetic level. But certainly, you know, what people go through in such a world. I just started watching, uh, Spartacus about tyranny and slavery and, and, and broken people who want to see gladiators kill each other. A, a male culture that arises because of a war of all against all being uh, per, favoring only those options that can prevail in such a war, which end up being the spirit of the gangster, the tyrant, the fascist. which illuminates also the meaning of the American battle of today of, between democracy and fascism. This is one of the arenas in which the whole uh, problem of civilization that was inevitable gets fought out. But anyway, I'm going to come back uh, now to a, a, a more concrete level because I've been watching... Um, I've been watching one of the dimensions in which this brokenness plays out and in, in, in illuminating, trying to illuminate one part of the political psychology uh, of this fascist um, force that's risen. I, I live in uh, an area that's, um, that's rural and traditional and conservative and somewhat fundamentalist. Um, And I don't really claim to know in great depth, but I've had years of exposure, which lead me to believe I know what I'm talking when I write this piece, which was an op-ed of mine. Let's see, when did I publish this one? Oh, just, just last March. Um, and the title of this piece is 
what men have lost in relation to women. And the title um, of this, you know, that I'm changing it to for this segment of this video is how culture change, men's loss of power and status, fed fascistic misogyny in America. Now, let me just add, I don't go into the social evolutionary aspect, um, but I've talked before in an earlier video, and I can't remember what the title of the video is, about how the step onto civilization by unleashing a war of all against all unleashed not only a social evolutionary process, uh, selection for the ways of power, but changed the status of men and uh, created a certain kind of male psychology um, which spreads brokenness, uh, which embodies brokenness, but was also adapted to for that world because you need warriors in, in your society who are able to prevail in a war of all against all. And that creates a dynamic that um, we are heir to. And particularly, I would say, uh, Southern culture is uh, heir to, but all of American culture is. But when I say Southern culture, when I wrote um, one of my books, uh, let me go there. Uh, I, um, I wrote a book about uh, healing the wounds that drive us to war. And a lot of those wounds are inflicted directly on men because uh, of the selective process that favors those cultural options that turn men into warriors that are able to, um, uh, how do I do this? That, that turn men into warriors that are able to fight and prevail in a war of all against all. And in the, the studying for um, that work, one of the sources that I used was an academic book by a guy named Wyatt Brown. I could look into the bibliography to get the exact citation, but it has something to do with the role of honor in the culture of the South. The role of honor is very much bound up into uh, the 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 casting of, of males into the role of warriors. Uh, you know, the insult, um, you've got to defend your honor. You fight a duel. Uh, it, I mean, it, all the connections that could be made are just uh, so numerous. But anyway, here I am uh, below the Mason-Dixon line in the state uh, where uh, the capital of the Confederacy uh, got relocated to, to Richmond. Um, that is a, in a county that's about to um, try to reaffirm through its school names the uh, attachment to this Southern culture that uh, uh, to defend Southern honor and the slave power, I might say, with more fundamentally, where the power and the wealth were invested, it, it, they're going to change the names of the schools, I'm predicting, back to uh, – names that honor Confederate heroes. So this is Trump country here. And this is what I wrote. The old movies I watch provide a glimpse into earlier times, and in particular into relations between men and women. The old power dynamic between the sexes these movies show greatly favored men. Men had more status than women. It was, quote, a man's world, unquote, run by men. It was completely appropriate for a man to wolf whistle when a good-looking woman walked by. Men forcing kisses onto women was acceptable, even a sign of manliness. Even heroes in the movies did it. Of course, such patterns weren't confined to movies. The world I grew up in 
had those patterns of male dominance built into them. The harshest thing a football coach could call players was girls. Having been taught that throwing like a girl was an insult, I was amazed when, as an adult, I saw a woman softball third baseman rifle a throw to first. When women became news anchors, it took some adjustment in how people understood authoritative. A lot has shifted since that earlier era. At every step of sexual intimacy, a new ethic says consent is required. Movie heroes no longer force their kisses even when they're a star. <laughs> Women who formerly needed their husbands to co-sign for them now control money, run businesses. More women than men now get college degrees. And this is in an era where the earnings gap between the college educated and the non-college workers in the American economy has grown wider which suggests that all those men lacking college education will be in an inferior position economically to many women with college degrees. Some women in some segments of American society are choosing to live without a man because they can't find a man that offers something she needs. All of this implies a painful loss for many men who have grown up expecting that being male will confer higher status and a dominant say over many things. And find themselves instead in this changed world, which gives them lower status and less power. And I'm not claiming that it's been equalized, but there's a loss. A world, for example, where Me Too has become an established part of the culture, where men can be punished for behaving with women the way so many men, including Harvey Weinstein and Donald Trump, have behaved. It's not surprising that some men have reacted to the pain of that loss, being denied the gratifications they expected with hostility toward the women who have gained the power and status that men have lost. Again, I'm not claiming equality, but a shift from one to the other. Responding to that loss in a constructive way is difficult, but not impossible. The cultural changes can lead to better outcomes than were offered by the old gratifications of male dominance. Although domination has its gratifications, the failure to grant women the full respect and equality they are entitled to diminishes the possibility of intimate relationship. And I want to add here that I think it was the last time out I shared with you. Uh, what I call the, the, the sacred space of lovers, which is about the wonderfulness that's possible, that is more possible when both parties give each other full respect and equality and, and uh, entitled to fair treatment. And uh, uh, well, how full can the relationship be when it's seen in, seen in terms consistent with a hero who might say, like many movie heroes did. Don't you worry your pretty little head about that. The challenge has been to learn a new pattern of relationship, one where men and women recognize and respect each other in equal measure, where genuine encounter takes place, and the two become mates in a more complete way than when one was made subordinate to the other. 
The old arrangement also imposed burdens on men. Any relationship will be incomplete in which the man followed the old rule that men don't show vulnerability because vulnerability is an inescapable and fundamental part of the human condition. Hiding that vulnerability and hiding the important feelings and needs that go with it means sacrificing intimacy. American men taught that heroes are the strong, silent type paid a price. And here I might interpose that a social evolutionary process that requires men to be optimally organized psychologically to be fierce warriors, downplays, teaches them to die vulnerability, pain, needs. But change at that level from a man expecting to be in control to one ready to go with the flow in a relationship between two whole human beings is hard to achieve. It requires a change in one's emotional posture and opening of the heart. And here I might add, was not in the piece, that people who are organized to perpetuate tradition, which is a large part of the conservative culture, are not going to be as capable of discarding things in a tradition and reorganizing themselves for something better. The difficulty of that challenge may help explain one of the political developments of our times. Polls show that a lot of white males without college education have aligned themselves with Donald Trump, a man whom everyone has heard bragging about sexually assaulting women and who has now been found by a jury of average Americans to have raped with his fingers a decent woman. Perhaps Trump is a hero to a lot of young men, angry about being denied the dominance they expected, not in spite of, but because of Trump's criminal way of asserting male dominance. Misogyny in the Trump party is perhaps to be understood as revenge against women. You might say a feature, not a bug. The division of the human world into male and female is quite fundamental. And the relationship between husbands and wives is a huge part of people's lives. It is not surprising then that a disturbance in that dimension, a cultural change more challenging than individuals or the culture can easily manage would have profound repercussions. Like for example, bolstering the angry and violent force of fascism, which is threatening right now to destroy and replace American democracy. Pain and rage always degrade the spirit of the human world and are always useful to fascistic forces. In case it needs to be said, I'm not excusing the misogyny. I believe that you hate the sin, but Try to understand the the sinner. To understand requires compassion. Even the ugliness in the world uh, needs to be understood. There's a particular sentence here I wanted to, I think in closing, um, 
yeah, I think in closing, I want to emphasize a particular sentence here because it, it takes us into a, something else that I've seen and experienced that has to do with um, the liberal side of our troubled society and uh, is problematic, I think, about the total picture of, what, of what's happening in the liberal world that uh, I wish were different. That sentence goes like, uh, like this. The division of the human world into male and female is quite fundamental. Now, I posted this piece where I post a lot of my stuff on daily costs which is a, I think, an outstanding community of a lot of intelligent people who are on the right side of a lot of issues. And, and, and a lot of the pieces that are there are of high quality. And I think a visit to Daily Costs, if, you, know, you can find some pieces there that'll tell you what's going on better than if you go to the New York Times, um, at least on certain issues, much of the time. But it's also a broad spectrum of, of the side of America that's fighting against um, this misogyny, this Trump, Trump force, this fascism. Um, and I encountered, when I published this thing, a fair amount of favorable comment. But I also took... Mm, I took, well, uh, calling it a beating would be too strong. There were people who snipped that sentence about the division of the world into male and female is quite fundamental. And wanted to clue me in that I was really on the wrong side of things here. I wasn't saying that that was that the division of the world between male and female was captured all the realities that we have around issues of sex or gender or anything like that. But what kind of political psychology is involved when you take somebody to task for saying that the division of the world, human world into male and female is quite fundamental? I mean, if you just look at the fact that in some way every one of the eight billion human beings that exists on this planet existed because in some way or other there was a coming together of something from the male and something from the human male and something from the human female i mean we've got more complexity than everything that's embodied in the majority Sure. And I, I'm all for anybody who is, uh, doesn't fall neatly within the majority ways in which things are, should be given due human respect, not be persecuted, not be uh, wrong, not be mistreated, given their respect for the fact that there is, in fact, uh, some human variety. But such a human majority is, uh, of people through the centuries and the millennia have had mothers and fathers as they were growing uh, up into being members of their societies. And the division of the human world into male and female was quite fundamental uh, to the family structure. Uh, I'm not going to argue that point. I mean, it should be really obvious, but what's important from a um, political psychology aspect is that, and this isn't the only time I've seen it in play, not just with respect to things that I've written, but other people too. There's, an, there's a kind of a tyranny that is seeking to impose uh, the neglected part of the traditional picture 
as required uh, of everybody to put front and center and dominant in the whole picture to a degree that I think distorts the world and only create, it doesn't help us uh, on the path toward truth and justice. I'm not quite qualified, informed enough to say that I think that J.K. Rowling has been mistreated by that kind of a tyranny. But my impression is that she has been willing to grant what should be granted to what the traditional ways of dealing with the, the majority way things are failed to do to accommodate the true needs uh, of people for the permission and space and liberty to be who they are and to be tr properly treated in being who they are. I think that she gave that, but she didn't give everything that was wanted. I, I have observed before that when people are liberated in really important ways, uh, valuable ways, I mean, people have been persecuted and it's really something to celebrate when those who have been persecuted, like being gay, which got Oscar Wilde thrown in jail. When people who are persecuted get liberated, there's a swing that goes to an extreme. Uh, the, what we see in A Tale of Two Cities is, yeah, we need a French Revolution, but no, we don't need a reign of terror like uh, the extreme that uh, got imposed when people who had been oppressed for a long time are able to rise up and they uh, assert their power that they, they, had not, they had been denied for so long. That may be perfectly understandable, but in today's America, I think that the side that I'm on, the liberal side, the pro-democracy side, the side of uh, goodwill toward people who are different from the majority in various ways, mutual respect side, I think we are in a place where excesses undermine the effectiveness of our side that needs to win the battle against fascism. So I know that, I think that I understand that people get triggered by one thing or another. People get triggered because there have been traumatic things that have been suffered. And I, I, things like that are not readily healed. But the quicker we can get to reason and not extreme, fairness and not imposing more than is appropriate, the better our side will be in winning over the rest of America and not giving the fascist side things to point to that alienate a lot of Americans who are not on the, on the bandwagon uh, of the extreme that the people who have been triggered seem to be seeking to impose. So I would like to see us find a more balanced place. I don't have any magic wand to wave, but I would say saying that the division of the human world into male and female is quite fundamental is something that should be just so obviously true that whatever it is that makes people think it really needs to be, listen, Buster, you got to get your head back together and see it's really this way. Well, we should get past that. We need to be, we need to be as sane as possible because we are dealing with something on the other side that is insane.
to a degree that is difficult to understand, but whether we understand it or not, we need to defeat it to protect what's most important about the America that we've got. 